Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron, I hope you're having a great day or night in Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us. We're going to be looking at the Textus Receptus. What is it today? Maybe, if not today, eventually get into differences between the Textus Receptus, the Byzantine text, and the majority text. There are some differences, not a ton, but some. Definitely not as many differences as between any of those texts and the eclectic text, critical text, also known as the Alexandrian text. So let's get started. Thanks for being here. We're going to start with Wikipedia, but then kind of bounce around a little bit, give some context to what we're talking about here on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, good and bad. I think there's more good than bad on Wikipedia. Long story. But anyhow, let's get started. Okay, the Textus Receptus, or that's Latin for the received text, refers to all printed editions of the Greek New Testament from Erasmus Novum Instrumentum Omni 1516. He did five editions, by the way. That's the type thing I'll throw in that's not in here. To the 1633 Elzevar Uncle and Nephew edition, where it was said the text now received by all. These are amazing people. It was the most commonly used text type for Protestant denominations. The Textus Receptus con constituted the translation base for the original German Luther Bible, the translation of the New Testament into English by William Tyndale, the King James Version, the Spanish Reni of Alira translation, the Czech Bible of Kralis, and most Reformation era New Testament translations throughout Western and Central Europe. And so it really in a sense, built uh, these things. And uh, a long story, I mean, they, they had eliminated slavery through this in a long way, but we won't go into all that. The text originated with the first printed Greek New Testament published in 1516, uh, work undertaken in Basel by the Dutch Catholic scholar, priest, and monk Desiderius Erasmus. A lot of information, disinformation about Erasmus on there. Please read his original writings and things he said was going on and uh, maybe histories. I think Baton may have a good history, Roland Baton, among so many others. And it's got a little picture. I'm going to read this to you. Text, therefore, you have that has now by everyone been received, accepted, admitted, emphasis added, the words from the Elzevar 1633 edition in Latin, from which the term Textus Receptus was derived. Okay, so Erasmus had been working on two projects for years, a collation of Greek texts and a fresh Latin New Testament. 1512, he began his work on the Latin New Testament. He collected all the Vulgate manuscripts that he could find to create a critical edition. Then he polished the Latin, declaring it is only fair that Paul should address the Romans in somewhat better Latin. In the earlier phases of the project, he never mentioned a Greek text. My mind is so excited at the thought of amending Jerome's text with notes that I seem to myself inspired by some god. I have already almost finished amending him by collating a large number of ancient manuscripts, and this I'm doing at enormous personal expense. So, fall of Constantinople, Byzantine Empire, 1453. The Greek manuscripts, Greek scholars flood to the West. This causes the Renaissance, eventually the Reformation, because of all the information coming from the East to the West regarding biblical manuscripts, with biblical manuscripts, enormous amounts, and uh, setting the mind free from what's been known as the Dark Ages in some corners. Won't go into the ins and outs of how uh, accurate that is with regards with my friend through e, uh, in the internet, the bionic mosquito, who I read vociferously with some of his great points. But anyhow, um, and so this has happened, and you have to remember who Erasmus is. He's considered to be the last man who knew everything, and he was considered maybe the brightest mind of the last millennia. He's a brilliant, brilliant person. And so while his intentions, but he talked about like the three-headed God Cerebrus of the Catholics and all this, while his intentions for publishing a fresh Latin translation are clear, it's less clear why he included the Greek text. Now, I did want to say too about Jerome. Jerome, admitted by almost everyone to be an incredible Hebraist, Hebraic scholar, phenomenal. 
um, his complaint, Jerome's complaint was the second he'd get done with the translation, they would take it from him to, you know, uh, get because they didn't have the printing press to be tr uh, copying and all of this. And he's like, man, I didn't have a chance to go back over it like I wanted to. So anyhow, he wanted to beat the Complutensian polyglot into print, which we need to do more on that. I've got a copy of that. I think I did a review maybe years ago on the Complutensian, maybe a couple. I need to do more on that. So Erasmus' new work was published by Froben of Basel in 1516, the Novum Instrumentum Omni. And uh, it's got the last page of the New Testament. Won't go into that. Holland, I think, does a great job saying maybe he did not back translate from the Vulgate. Typographical errors attributed to the rush to complete the work abounded in the published text. Now remember, the Complutensian came out 1518, Cardinal Zimini, so he, he did beat that out. Uh, Erasmus also lacked a complete copy of the Book of Revelation. Um, Consequently, although the Textus Receptus is classified by scholars as a late Byzantine text, it differs in nearly 2,000 readings from the standard form of this text type represented by the majority text of Hodges and Farstad, which Zayn Hodges and Arthur Farstad are good people, as far as I know. The edition was a sellout commercial success, reprinted in 1519, with most but not all the typographical errors committed. Uh, uh, corrected, excuse me. And so that's the second edition, then third, fourth, fifth edition. Okay, now here's a very important part. Erasmus has been studying Greek New Testament manuscripts for many years in the Netherlands, France, England, and Switzerland, noting their many variants. So that's a huge thing that uh, he already knew about this. Uh, you know, he'd been studying this. And so then from Erasmus, you come to Robert uh, Stephanus, Etienne, printer from Paris. He uh, edited the Greek New Testament four times, 1546, 1549, 1550, 1551, the last in Geneva. The edition of 1551 contains a Latin translation of Erasmus in the Vulgate. So this is where the text now received by all comes from. The 1633 edition, produced by Bonaventure and his nephew Abraham Elzevar, the one where it says, text now received by all. Okay, and so uh, that's where it comes from. Now, I did want to say this, the relationship to the Byzantine text. The Textus Receptus was mainly established on a basis of manuscripts of the Byzantine text type, also called the majority text, usually is identified by his followers. However, in addition, over many years, Erasmus has extensively notated New Testament citations and early fathers, such as Augustine, Ambrose, biblical quotations. Then you have Scrivener, Bergon, Minuscule One. Um, two other things I want to bring. Well, I say two, it's really just one. But it's a defense of Erasmus. And this is by Frederick von Nolan. I've got this book from 1815. A 19th century historian and Greek Latin scholar spent 28 years trying to trace the Textus Receptus to apostolic origins. He was an ardent advocate of the supremacy of the Textus Receptus over all other editions of the Greek New Testament, and he argued that the first editors of the printed Greek New Testament intentionally selected those texts because of their superiority and disregarded other texts, which represented other text types because of their inferiority. It is not to be conceived that the original editors of the Greek New Testament were wholly destitute of a plan in selecting those manuscripts out of which they were to form the text of their printed editions. Now, I did want to say they're leaving out like the 10 editions of Bizet and all this. In the sequel, it will appear that they were not altogether ignorant of two classes of manuscripts, one of which contains the text which you've adopted from them, the other the text which has been adopted by Mr. Greisbach. And regarding Erasmus, here's what Nolan says. This is Frederick von Nolan. Count Nolan, nor let it be conceived in disparagement of the great undertaking of Erasmus. He was merely fortuitously right, 
had he barely undertaken to perpetuate the tradition on which he received the sacred text, he would have done as much as he could be required of him, with more than sufficient to put to shame the puny efforts of those who had vainly uh, labored to improve upon his design. With respect to manuscripts, it's indisputable. Now, this is an extremely important quote. It is because it's a man that studied this for 28 years. It's indisputable that he was acquainted with every variety which is known to us, having distributed them into two principal classes, one of which corresponds with the Clumpetensian and the other with the Vatican manuscript. And he has specified the positive grounds in which he received the one and rejected the other. And I've also done some reviews like on... Uh, Erasmus paraphrases of the New Testament, some of Erasmus's other writings, his letters. I've got uh, compendiums of his letters. Lady up at uh, the University of Toronto's big Erasmian scholar. And uh, some of the myths of Erasmus. It's been very hard to root some of those myths out. Like him saying, I'll include 1 John 5 7 if you can show me one Greek manuscript with it. You know, that's now shown evidently to never happen. And uh, on and on. So he knew he, he was going, as he stated himself, he said he's been going everywhere, great cost. And so he's looking at manuscripts. And so uh, I read in another place that he had to hire one person that walked around with a mule just to keep all the manuscripts he had. So to say he only had six manuscripts to translate from, extraordinarily disingenuous. And somebody really doesn't know the history. And sometimes they actually are so biased against like the King James, they falsify it in, you know, uh, they just do. And, you know, people have slants and all this. So we, we're all a possibility of, of this. But that he knew, uh, you know, been examining hundreds of manuscripts, just took these six, but he knew of the different variations and what he needed to correct even in those six. So we're going to stop right there. So that is where the Texas Receptus comes from, what the Texas Receptus is. And uh, it's not identical to the Byzantine text. It's not identical to the majority text. And like the King James text, nobody's really been able to say, well, it came from Bizet's, what, ninth edition or something. And, but really, it's an eclectic text. because so they were going back to the Polish and the uh, <laughs> Slovenian or something. I can't remember. The Tepel Codex, the pre-Luther New Testament, 1483, on and so forth. And uh, so they had kind of an eclectic text. Because they just wanted what was the apostolic text. That was the key without error. And they did an amazing job. So God bless. Thanks for being here with us. Share with your friends. Put it on social media. We'll talk with you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.